I want to kick off a brand new series, and with that, I want to talk about choices that produce the life you've always wanted. We will, in our lifetime, literally make millions of choices, but thankfully, most of those choices are not life-altering choices. I've discovered that, honestly, there are so many choices some days where you didn't think there were going to be as many as there were, but when you need more toothpaste, (laughs) have you noticed they need a whole aisle for 500 different versions of toothpaste. Is this not true? And you go down and you, you, you just can't figure out, you know, do I need the whiter teeth? Do I need the fresh breath? Do I, do, yes, you do. do. Do I need the plaque control? What do I need? And it, really, at the end of the day, if you just brush your teeth and floss and see your dentist regularly, it's really not ultimately going to change your life what toothpaste you choose. Is this not true? And yet, that's not true with other choices. There are some choices that change the direction of our lives. The question really becomes, with a million choices throughout our lifetime, how do you know which ones matter or which ones matter more? Because it truly is a time in our world where there seems to just be choice after choice after choice after choice, and you can truly get to the place where You don't even make certain decisions because there's just so many things to choose from and you almost get decision paralysis where you don't know which thing to choose. And so this series is going to be uh, first and foremost about the primary choice that we need to make because that's what God says and then choices that support that and actually help us do that because contrary to popular opinion, all choices don't lead to the same outcomes. And that's even true with faith. So in other words, think about this just in a, in a travel situation. If you wanna go to San Diego, you cannot get on I-5 North, leaving the Bay Area, going out 580 and then going north and get to San Diego. I don't care what kind of car you drive. <laughs> I don't care if you're rolling in style or not, what, well, how fast you're going. It doesn't matter how fast you're going. If you're going the wrong direction, you're not going to get to your destination. And so it is with our faith. There are times people want this outcome. They want the outcomes of God, but they're going the wrong direction. And so it truly is worthwhile for us to evaluate our choices. So whether you're here because somebody invited you to be a part of a water baptism, whether you found us online and you don't even really know why you're listening right now, or whether this is you know, a normal habit for you to come to a place of worship, it is worthwhile that we take time to evaluate the most important choices in our lives because there are outcomes that we want. And the last time I checked, we have one life. So this is not a video game where you earn extra lives, you know, where if you blow up the first one, you can kind of go to the reserve lives. You know, I got two or three lives left. No, we got one life. And at the the risk of sounding pessimistic, which I'm not, I mean, this is just in the category realistic, you and I have limited time. So we have years and, and probably most of us, we have decades, but we don't have centuries, We certainly don't have unlimited time. When you look at the scope of your life in in light of history and in light of eternity, our lives are very short. You know, I've been a pastor now a lot of years, and so I've been to far more baby dedications than most of you, and I've been to far more memorial and funeral services than most of you. And every single memorial or funeral service that I'm a part of, there's always a person's name listed on a program or on a screen, and then underneath their name is what? dates. There is a birth date and there is a last day, at least last day on earth. So what I sometimes call an expiration date. Every one of us have an expiration date. I think it's invisibly tattooed on our lives right now. We don't know what it is, but God does. And so we have a beginning date and we have an expiration date. And in the middle of those two um, dates is a little dash. And ironically, that little tiny line represents the person's life. So regardless of whether they've lived 110 years or whether they've lived just 10 years, it's really about the same length of time because, again, in light of eternity and certainly even in light of just history, it's a relatively short time to make sure we get this thing right. And so I want to just one more time commend you for being here. I'm glad you're here because I believe that throughout this series, 
we're gonna talk about some things that can reduce anxiety. When you don't know for sure if you're headed in the right direction, that actually should produce a level of anxiety in you because that is God's mechanism inside of us to actually have a, a certain built-in network, spiritual um, intuitiveness, that we're not doing what he wants us to do. And so certain things make us feel like we can't rest. Some of you are restless because you're not on the path God wants for you. And you don't know why that restlessness is in you, but I'm here to tell you, God put something inside of you so that your spirit, would, when it is out of sync with your creator, actually feels restless. It feels like it's not at home. And some of us deal with uh, tremendous uh, complexities that you have to try to manage. And some of it today feels like weight. And we'll, we'll talk about some things where I actually feel like when you begin to do what we even look at today, certain amount of weight is gonna be lifted off of you because you realize it's not simply about your best efforts. It's about God's ultimate supernatural help that he wants to bring into your lives. And so I'll, I'll just one more time just say, I'm glad that you're here I believe God's gonna do some important things with us. And we have a theme verse for this series. It's one sentence long. It was part of what's called uh, the Sermon on the Mount. I'm gonna ask you to read it with me. It's Matthew 6, so look on your notes or look on the screen. Let's read this out loud together. It says this, but, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first, so circle those two words because those are key words within that sentence. And first is not um, like a 100 meter race where first places first, microseconds ahead, ahead of second, microseconds ahead of third or fourth or whatever, where you know first, second, and third are really all kind of lumped together. No, this is first, as if there's no second. First, as if in its preeminent. It is dominant above every other thing. In fact, there is a translation that puts it that way. It says, seek first God's kingdom above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything that you need. Now, I like one of the things that this verse does. It actually tells you the why. So the what is seek first, the why is because God wants to actually bring into your life the things that you're going to need so that you can accomplish his will. That's a tremendous why. That's a tremendous sentence right there. But if you're like me, um, because I grew, up, I, I grew up in good churches and, and you know, last series, if you were here, I told you there are different times where I didn't always understand everything, but because somebody was proclaiming God's word, God's word was powerful enough to get inside of me. But I also realized there was one deficit that over the years I noticed, uh, now in hindsight, they rarely talked about why. And I'm one of these people, I wanna know why. So if you tell me to do something, there's, there's enough of an inquisitive side of my mind where I wanna know why you're doing what you're doing. Like if, we, if I go to a store, I'm probably not always, fortunately if I take my car in, I just want them to fix it. But honestly, if they let me go out there, I would be out there with them. I just want to see what they're doing. Why are you doing that? What does that actually do? Like I would be that person. I would be the annoying one perhaps, you know, out there. But I, I've learned actually there's a value of that when you come to scripture because there are whys in the Bible, not just what's. But I grew up only hearing about the what and very little about the why. Jesus gave us one just in that one sentence. But there are far more benefits that are listed in Scripture that are worth our time to look at today. Because I'll even say this about perhaps maybe another kind of person I didn't talk about earlier. Some of you are uptight too much. And, uh, and people, if you don't know, ask your friends. They could tell you. And, uh, and you're just wound up a little too tight. And at some point, I honestly think a, a certain amount of that is because you feel the need to actually produce outcomes. You want to achieve. You want to get ahead. All, all those things are fine. But you don't realize you don't have to do it all on your own. Some of you are parenting and you have a challenge in front of you for one reason or another. And it's not always an easy thing to navigate. And I want to tell you, God is here to help you. 
He will help you with all the different, it's finances for some of you, it's health for some of you. It, there, there's, there's uncertain things about our lives and it can make us uptight when we don't actually go to the Lord and make him the first thing that we seek, his kingdom and his ways first. But I wanna give you a few other benefits and lean into that today. And then throughout this series, we'll talk about the choices that help build that up. So here's number one. Here's the first benefit for why to put God first. Number one, you are created. Say created. created. You are created for a God first life, including being in a real and rich relationship with your heavenly father. No one can get to a destination that God has for you unless you do it God's way. Now, this is where Christianity becomes unique to other religions where many times religions are just simply a pathway, someone says, a pathway that if you just go there, it's gonna lead to the, the same pathway as another religion. This is just my choice and it, you know, everything leads to the same outcome. Well, it, it doesn't, just like I gave you with the analogy of trying to go I-5 North and getting to San Diego, it doesn't work. And so, there is a time in which we need to realize we were created by God to know God through Jesus. And even though your parents had some biological input into that, can I tell you this? Your parents played a smaller role than God in who you are. They created the, some of the DNA that went into you being you, but they did not create your soul and spirit. They helped create the physical side of your lives by being physically involved with one another in a manner in which God created them to able, be able to actually do that. But their physiology in your story is not as significant as God's spirituality to give you a soul and a spirit. And your soul and your spirit craves to know God, craves to know the creator. In Matthew 6, Jesus talked about a kingdom and um, I think we've all been reminded just recently because of what's going on in England about kings and, and you know, um, monarchies. And, you know, a, a kingdom, a king has a kingdom and, and a throne. And so when Jesus uses those analogies, it actually kind of begs the question, what kind of king? If we're going to put his kingdom first, who is the his of that sentence? And all you have to do sometimes in your Bible, is I want people to always not just value sermons, value the Bible more than sermons. Value the Bible more than podcasts. Value the Bible and in getting into God's word. And if you want to do that, you, you need to learn about context. And so uh, we read Matthew 6.33. But right before Matthew 6.33, all Bible students, is Matthew 6. Yeah, see, see, some of you didn't realize how, how much you already know about the Bible. So before Matthew 6.33 is Matthew 6.32, here's where we find out who the he is. Because it's not just the generic name God. And Jesus is going to reference the Heavenly Father. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your, what are the next two words? Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Your Heavenly Father. Jesus regularly references God as God the Father or our Heavenly Father. The Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. Jesus refers to the Father giving the inference of this. The king that sits on this throne wants to be in relationship with his people. Now, maybe you've done what Crystal and I did a number of years ago, and, and maybe again because, you know, uh, England has been in the story, and London and the monarchy was just, you know, in the news. Um, you now have a new interest, I don't know. But uh, uh, there was a number of years ago, we were in London, and we went to Buckingham Palace. In full disclosure, we went to where Buckingham Palace is. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, what we actually did was stand outside the gates, and peer in, like tourists do. You know, we didn't have the invite to come into Buckingham Palace. And, and yet, I, I learned something while we were there. We didn't see the royal uh, flag being flown over Buckingham Palace, and that's 
cue to let you know if the monarch is there. Well, back in the day, it was the queen, and the flag wasn't there, which meant she wasn't in that building because wherever she is, the royal flag flies. Even if she's in a vehicle, it flies on that vehicle, but she happened to have been out in Windsor Palace. Well, within a day or so, Crystal and I got on the train, and we went to Windsor. <laughs> well, at this particular time, we got into the palace, at least parts of it. Not one time did she come out and greet us. We have flown across the globe to come to her land, to come to her house. She didn't seem to care. <laughs> didn't even seem to care. And uh, not so with the king that sits on this throne. He knows your needs. He wants you to put him first, not because his existence gets better, but because ours does, because he knows everything about you and wants to know you like a heavenly father. You may not have had a good earthly father, but you have a heavenly father who's perfect. You have a heavenly father that created you. You have a heavenly father that wants to know you. The starting point to a relationship with God the Father is salvation through Jesus, his son. One day Jesus said something extraordinarily important. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That, that is interesting because on the one hand, it is uniquely exclusive. You have one way, Jesus said, but then he invited everybody. Isn't that great? Whoever believes, like whoever, whoever wants to come, whoever will confess Jesus as Lord shall be saved. So Jesus invites everyone, but you gotta come through him to get to the Father. Yeah. I love this verse out of Ephesians. It says, long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We who stand before him covered with his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. He did this because he wanted to. Do you know Jesus wants you to be in a relationship with the Father so much so that he came to earth to die in our place, to be the bridge, to be the door, to be the one way that we can actually be in relationship with God the Father. We ought to put God first because we are created by God to know God through Jesus Christ. If you have yet to discover a relationship with Jesus before we even get to our baptisms today, I will pray that you can invite Jesus into your life and you can be born Again, is what Jesus said. Well, here's number two, because there are benefits. Number two, putting God first can eliminate worry as we trust in his goodness and faithfulness. It can eliminate worry. I don't know, it seems like we're living in a time where not only do people worry, they have truly turned it into a lifestyle where they are defined by it. They don't just have moments that they worry. Every day, there is worry. Sometimes, perhaps, you could describe your life as, I, I worry every hour. And yet, Jesus connects worry-free living with seeking him first. Again, good Bible students, like you all are, will read the context. This is actually just part of a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Now we're just gonna back up a few more verses where Jesus said this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Do they not, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father, there it is again, heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And then here's a great question. Can any of you, by worrying, Add a single hour to your life? Yes or no? no? By worrying, can you reduce perhaps the length of your life? Oh yeah, 
Yeah, your stress levels can be so high, you can actually do physical damage to your body, which might actually lessen the length of your life. But by worrying, you cannot make it longer. And yet, how in the world do we get rid of worry? What Jesus is doing is inviting us into a different way to live. That's how you do it. You just say, I'm not gonna live a worry, worry driven life, I'm gonna live a seek first life. And by leaving one behind and going into the other is how you and I actually begin to eliminate worry from our lifestyles. Somebody needs to hear this today because of what you deal with on a regular basis. The, the, the amount of stress that you live under or in is, is perhaps a reminder that you're, even if you're a follower of Jesus, you can you can ask Jesus to forgive your sins, but if you truly haven't trusted him with your entire life, you can live every day still with worry. And Jesus wants to begin to push worry out of our lives as we begin to seek him first. He will not only move into a relationship with you that's deeper than just forgiveness of our sin, He'll begin to get into a relationship with you that's defined as a loving Heavenly Father and we sang about it and Crystal underscored it. There is a faithfulness to this God that he does not let you down. He's not saying don't care about eating or what you have to wear. or you know, He's not be, saying be careless. He's just saying don't worry about all the things that people who don't know me worry about. I'll, I'll, gi I'll give you what you need. I'll help you. I wanna just underscore this again. Those of you that are parents, and truly there is a, a level of weight on you that has been there and is difficult, but there is a sense that God wants to help you where you are at with what worries you, what concerns you, what's on you. He will help you. He will help you. And so we seek him first just simply because of the worry that comes in our lives if we don't. Here's number three. Decisions are easier and better because we don't have to figure it all out on our own. If you uh, track with any of our online devotions, um, last week, uh, Greg Wingard uh, led our devotion for us, and he gave a phrase in that devotion that I thought is interesting. He called it decision fatigue. And I thought, I have that. I know what that is. You know, I kind of referenced it at the beginning. You know, you, there's just so many things to decide on. At some point, you just say, I don't really want to decide right now, and you have decision fatigue. Well, he linked um, overcoming decision fatigue with honoring God's ways. And the whole point is this, and it was last week's message about God's ways. But God's ways are better than our ways, and when God declares his way, we don't have to decide. Well, all, we have to decide one thing. Am I gonna do what he said or not? But we don't have to figure out every answer to every question because God has given us many, many answers already in his word. God has given us so much direction in his word. Seriously, it can reduce the amount of decisions we make because God has already made them for us. We just have to decide, am I gonna go God's way or not? And putting God's first, it talks about seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Righteousness is a fancy word. I'll kind of give you a general description of it. It's heaven's way. Righteousness is God's way. It's heaven's way. And so when you seek first God and his ways, all these other things are added to you as well. And part of that is a, a less, Worry-free life, but part of that worry-free comes from you don't have to know everything. You don't have to figure everything out. You just need to get into God's word and say, God, have you already said something that I need to know? Here, here's what's so great about the more you walk with Jesus and the more you get in his word, the more God actually starts giving you revelation about his ways, and now you don't have to decide certain things because it's already been decided. And if it's not clear in scripture, because I've talked about things over the years like, well, you know, when, I, when it came time for college, I couldn't find a single college listed in the Bible. You know, so God, where do I go? I can't find one. You know, and, 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 and so in those cases, God promises you his wisdom. So as you are presented with options, God can take 
all these options and he can illuminate one, kind of highlight it to the surface, bring it to the surface. He can give you kind of an insight. He'll use sometimes a still small voice in your mind. He might use someone else's wise counsel. He might just make a door close over here and you don't have to be sad about closed doors because sometimes that's just God's grace to eliminate options that you were thinking about that were weighing on you and now that closed door actually moves you over here and then you sense, I think this is the open door. Is that not God's grace? If, he, if you have four doors to try to figure out which is the right one, he closes three of them and then says, now decide <laughs> which one. I think I'll take the open door. And so it's like, thank you, Jesus, for making it easier for me. Somebody is weighed down because of a decision or decisions you need to be making, and you don't even know where to begin. I want to tell you, just begin with your heavenly father. He knows all your needs. You seek him first, and one of the great benefits isn't just salvation, it's his leadership. It's why we call him Savior and Lord. Lord means king. So we all have a little kingdom inside of our own lives. And, and we all start out sitting on the throne of our own little kingdom. And God says, if you'll just get off the throne and let me sit on that throne, I'll help you. I'll lead you. I won't just save you. I won't just get you ready for heaven. That little dash called your life, I'll help you with all the details of your life. Praise God for that. So many people struggle with so much that they don't need to simply because they are not seeking him and his righteousness, his ways first. Can anybody just take a moment and thank God that he's so good, he cares about the details, he cares about the big things, the little things, and all the other things. He can help us. Now, this is so far, the benefits of of, uh, Seek First, we've given you three of them. That would be enough to say this is a good Sunday. Just saying. Those are great things. I'm not, not because I said them, but because we're talking about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to give you a fourth one because Jesus will continue the Sermon on the Mount and he'll end with his story. And by the way, on your notes, it should say chapter seven and not chapter six. That was my mistake. But it's Matthew chapter seven. It's the last part of the whole uh, Sermon on the Mount. And it says this, and I want to read it before I give you the point. Therefore, Everyone, say everyone. Everyone. That means you. That means me. Who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man or a wise woman. Jesus' illustration is not gender exclusive to males. It's just how he's describing this. But whoever, whoever, anyone who who does this, who built his house on a... Uh, built his house in rocks, the rains will come, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because, of, because it had a, what's the next word? Foundation. A foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man or a foolish woman who built his house in the sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the wind blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I don't know um, the last time, you know, you were in a housing, you know, search uh, to where you were either renting or buying or, you know, investing or something like that. But um, you probably didn't pay a lot of attention to the foundation. If you, you need to know about it, but you probably didn't go home and say, man, I can't get that foundation out of my mind. It was amazing, the foundation. But if the foundation is poor, you don't want to buy that house. You don't want to live in that house because storms do come and things do happen and you don't want that thing to crash down on you because of a poor foundation. So here's number four. God first living produces a strong foundation and superior outcomes. You know one decision we're not given? Whether we want, well, I guess you could want them or not, but whether you have problems or not. You are not, and I am not given that option. We're gonna live in a world that has problems. God didn't say, you know what, at some point, if you bring me into your life, you can decide whether you want problems. No, God said, Jesus specifically said, in this world, you'll have some trouble. 
Take courage, I've overcome the world. So don't let that overwhelm you. If you're built on a firm foundation, you will be able to withstand the storms, the problems, the challenges that come against you that want to push you back and destroy you and knock you down. The, why, the, the, the strong foundation. And as I said, even though you know, we don't oftentimes talk about foundations, it's not what gets the attention, it's certainly what brings stability. I wonder what you're building your life on right now. And uh, Jesus is saying, the wise person hears the word of God, hears this teaching about a heavenly father, hears things like seek first his kingdom, and they don't just agree with it, they put it into practice. So as we go through the rest of the series, I'll just give you a little teaser on the rest of this, and then we'll have baptisms. First, F-I-R-S-T, a little acrostic on your notes. We're gonna talk about family and friends. That you and I need to put God ahead of family and friends, and when we do, God will help you with your family and your friends. That's Mother's Day. Don't miss Mother's Day. Then we're gonna talk about our identity. That's a huge topic today. Bring every millennial you know. We'll talk about the value of identity. Bring your grandparents too, because they need to know about identities. Our resources and career. We, on average, will spend about 30% of our waking hour, hours at our careers. That's a big chunk of your life. You wanna get that one dialed in in such a way that you get the outcomes of God when you're putting your time in, when you just thought it was your job. God says, oh no, it's much more than that. There's value in your career that's bigger than just you making a living. And then S is stresses. We all have some. There are things God wants to say to us about the problems and challenges of our lives. And then the last one is time. Time, it's one of the big commodities. If you truly do all the other things well, but honestly, you just start, you start reducing the amount of time you give the Lord over your life to where it's just a little bit here and a little bit there, you will not get the benefits of what we're talking about today. Seek his, first, seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In a moment, I wanna pray for the baptism candidates. I wanna ask all of us just to close our eyes, those of you online as well, uh, just take a moment in your home if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus was the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But the invitation, as I said, Jesus came into the world so that all could be saved. Everyone is invited. That means you and me. Let me pray for that first. Jesus, we need you. Thank you, God, for creating us. Thank you, Jesus, for bridging the gap between us and a holy God a perfect father. How, how, how would we ever be able to relate with perfection unless, Jesus, you bridge the gap between where we are and where God the Father is? Thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying on a cross, suspending yourself between heaven and earth and being the sacrifice for us so that you could present us to your Father as perfect people in Christ Jesus. What an amazing transaction. We give you our worst and you transform us from the inside out. 